Welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host, Jeremy Miller. Every week, I chat with fascinating people from all walks of life in order to bring you knowledge, inspiration, and insight. If you enjoy the show, you can support it by subscribing, leaving a review, and sharing it with a friend. This is the Jeremy Miller Podcast. Corey Berlin, welcome to the podcast, man. Yes, sir. Good to have you here. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. It's been a long time coming, and it's good to be here. Dude, I'm, I got to say I'm a little salty that your PR for your marathon and half marathon are both faster than me. <laughs> you know, I'm glad you said that right off the top because, you know, yesterday you kind of previewed our podcast here with calling me an older runner. And uh, we I mean that in the best way. Well, we figured out that you're 19 <laughs> years younger than me. So that's very fair for you to say that. Uh, but I do want you to remind all the people listening that, uh, yeah, I was a little faster than you in the, in the Chicago marathon. Oh, dude. Well, let them know because yeah, you ran, uh, <laughs> What I saw was 243.15, right? That's right. Yeah, and I came in 244.11, so you were, what, Very close. 57, 56 seconds ahead yeah, of me? Yeah, not even a minute, so. Oh, dude. I remember, because uh, we did the first, maybe like eight to 10 miles together, mm-hmm. I think. Yep. And then uh, there's a one point, was it your wife that handed you a bottle? It was a friend. Okay. Yeah, uh, my, my buddy's uh, wife, actually, so. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I saw, you, know, you ran off to the side of the course a little bit, grabbed the bottle, and I think, probably seeing somebody you knew gave you a little boost. Yeah. And then after that, I never saw you again. Because yeah. I was like, oh my gosh, he's moving right now. You're not going to be able to keep up with him. <laughs> but and you were right behind me, bro. So. Apparently. Um, yeah. I, I thought you were going to be like 235 or something oh the way gosh. you were moving. <laughs> One day. One day. Dude, 243 is so impressive, man. And your half, uh, what I saw again was 119.12. Is that accurate? Yep. The, this early, early this year in Houston. Uh, had a good had a good half. Was able to run with my coach Richard Garcia, and nice. and uh, we both paced it out and and did pretty well. Dude, that's moving. That's uh, is that six minute pace? Right at a little bit over six. Yeah. Right, at, right at six. Man, I did the Woodlands earlier this year, and the yeah. goal was sub one nineteen, and I ran one nineteen nineteen. So you got yeah. me by seven seconds yeah. there too. So, yeah, not not much ahead of you on that one. <laughs> that's dude. I whenever before I got into running, I want to get your thoughts on this. Is like, I thought a half marathon or a marathon was just go out and like just survive and finish it but i learned when you're actually going for times you're like near sprinting for two or three hours no absolutely and i think like we talked about we've talked about it before like that's what makes the marathon very difficult is that you're not there's no easy points in the race you have to maintain a pace for a long time over 26 miles and you're either going to do it or or hit that wall and so it's it's a very difficult distance i think for a lot of people how have you grown maybe mentally and physically since your first marathon, which was not that long ago Yeah. Uh, to like the, the most recent one you did, which was New York, right? Right. So yeah, in 2020, right, like a month before COVID shut everything down, I was able to run the Cowtown uh, Marathon in Fort Worth. And leading up to it, I was probably doing 40 miles max a week, <laughs> uh, which is crazy because yeah. you're, you don't really – you don't do well in marathons without a good aerobic base, a good volume. And I, I ran the race training basically with no easy miles, just everything going out and running at marathon pace. So my my whole, whatever it was, 12 weeks was everything at marathon pace, uh, for about 40 miles a week. Did you get injured at all? No, thank God. That's Uh, impressive. Yeah. So I was able to, uh, I thought I almost got injured during the race because that was the worst I've ever felt. Uh, glad that was my first one. It's behind me, but that was the worst I've ever felt in a race. Definitely hit the wall. Uh, I scraped out with the, the three Oh six. So I was, that's impressive. You know, I, I just didn't know what I was doing. So I didn't even really know if that was great or not. I had a buddy tell me like the day after, like, dude, you qualified for Boston. I'm like, cool. What, you know, is that good? You know, <laughs> yeah. so I had no idea. So, uh, yeah, well, I've, I've come a long way in four years, yeah. uh, just the knowledge and how to train and how to be smart. That's incredible. Yeah. So, did you know what the Boston qualifying time was at the time? I had, I had, an, I had had people tell me. You know, yeah. they they kind of said, "Oh, so are you going to shoot for this?" And I'm like, "I'm just going to go try to finish and finish fast." Yeah. Um. So I, I knew that that was kind of out there. Uh. But but again, little knowledge of kind of the prestige of of that race or yeah. any of these majors for that matter. What uh, What do you think gave you the confidence to be like, "Oh, I'm going to go and try and." qualify for boston my very first marathon i was running pretty good paces according to people that you know that knew what they were doing i had friends that uh that have raced several times before that and half marathons full marathons and 
I'd send them some of my workouts. Hey, I'm, I'm right at about a 645 pace here. Is that pretty good? You know, yeah, you're holding that for 20 miles. You should be able to. So I had an idea of what I wanted to shoot for, yeah. but I just had no clue that it would feel that bad. You know, once you get to mile <laughs> 22, 23, it was brutal. Oh, dude, it hit me like a train my first marathon, I remember. Did you did you know anything about like nutrition back then? Like, did you Zero. carb low? Did you take gels, anything? Zero. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did you feel it all during the race? Uh, Water and Gatorade. Oh, my uh, gosh. You know, I don't even think I had you really didn't I do took gels? gels. No, I don't even think I took gels Holy for that race. Holy cow. Yeah. What's the BQ time for whatever your age was at that time? So I was, um, I was 41. I was 41, maybe, maybe 40, uh, about to turn 41. And the BQ time was 310. So, oh my gosh. so I scraped under it and then COVID happened and they lowered the standard. So I actually didn't go from that first, uh, that first right. qualifying time. Dude, first marathon, 41 years old, 306. Yeah. With terrible training, it sounds like. Horrible training. No coach, just going out and just doing it when I could and trying to to run fast. That That's, was just like, if you're going to run a marathon, you got to run fast dude, all the time. <laughs> dude, that, I think most newbies have that mindset. Sure. And you either get injured or it just turns into a big suffer fest, basically. Yeah. Uh, before that, were you active? Like, did you play sports? Did you like, like, what did you do before to have that kind of base inherent fitness to go run a 306? Yeah, so I, I grew up uh, playing football and baseball. Uh, but football turned into kind of my love. Yeah. Uh, football, I played in high school in Shreveport, Louisiana, Evangel Christian. Um, I played on a high school team that went 60-0 and 0 over four years. So a lot wow. of success. They're still doing really well. Uh, then I went on to play college football at Louisiana Tech. I was a wide receiver there. And and so that competitive drive, that that being on a team, um, yeah. that really kind of stoked that fire. And it's always been a big part of my life. My brother played a quarterback for the University of Miami, and then he oh, went on wow. to play in the NFL for four years. So football has been a huge part of our family for a long time. Yeah. And then, you know, I went to school, got my master's in physical therapy, um, settled down, uh, started a family. I have three, uh, three boys, and I kind of just wasn't competing in anything for that stretch of time. Uh, getting close to my 40-year-old birthday, um, I have a couple of coworkers that, that – run recreationally and they're just like hey we think you should come out and do this half marathon with us uh, but you know it's the day before your 40th birthday come on out and do it it ended up being the marathon in waco i don't know if you've heard of that one uh -uh. it's advertised jeremy as the toughest half in texas oh, wow. and the reason being is because over the 13 miles it's it goes up and down the hills in cameron park so you're going up and down like six may just major hills oh dang so a lot of elevation and i thought you know, that competitive spirit in me started <laughs> coming in and I was like, if these guys, you know, can do it, I can, I yeah. can go train for this and do it. So I, I started training for it. It took me about, you know, six weeks. I, you know, I built up to about 10 miles on a long run. So you weren't doing any running before that? Zero. Yeah. Wow. Zero running. I, I would go to the gym occasionally and, you know, mess around, but nothing, right. nothing serious. Uh, Cause I just didn't really have the time. My kids were really young. Um, so I signed up for that race, ended up doing it. I think I was like a one thirty six or something, uh, on a hard course, on too. a hard course. And, and again, I was like, is that good? You know, <laughs> I still saw people finishing in front of me. So I was like, yeah. man, I can, I can get better. Uh, so I, I really enjoyed it. It was, it was fun, you know, you know, yeah. finishing a race, especially the first one you ever do. It's, it's exhilarating yeah. whether you feel bad or not. Yeah. So I signed up for two more that year. That was 2019. I think I did one in Irving and then one uh, in Shreveport, Louisiana, where my, my family lives. So we did those two. Those are all half marathons? All halves. I got a little better each time. I think the last one I did that year was like a 129, barely. Dang. So I'm like, and then when I finished that one, I'm like, there's no way that I could do this back to back, like a full marathon, right, right. like zero <laughs> chance, because I was just emptying the tank. And I have a friend, Trent Wyrick, he's in Shreveport, and he's just like, man, I think, I think you need to start training for it. And, you know, here's, here's one, he circled the cow town on the, on the calendar. And he said, just here, here's, I'm going to, you know, talk you through it. And again, he's just like telling me the mileage, but I go out and I'm just running everything hard. <laughs> like I'm running those half marathons. And that was kind of the start of, yeah. of getting ready for that first marathon. Uh, Dude. cause I had done those three halves. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. I can't believe 
you really haven't dealt with any injuries or have you dealt with any injuries since getting into it? No, very lucky, um, you know, that I haven't. I, I know that that's a, that's a big part of running. I, I'm, you know, I'm a physical therapist, so right. I do, um, I do know certain things, injury prevention, prehab, certain techniques yeah. that, that are good. Um, and I think that's a, that plays a huge part, you know, for any runner. And, and then again, yeah. strength training as well as, is a huge part of, of what I do. And I don't do nearly as much as probably you do. I mean, I see these deadlifts. And these, <laughs> I probably do too much. <laughs> this, <laughs> this, this crazy deadlift and bench press routine, but enough with, with uh, body weight, little kettlebells, yeah. things to, to work on those muscles that, that yeah. definitely need the stabilization. Yeah. I mean, that's all you need really. It's, it just depends yeah. on your goals. Like if your goal is to like be a super efficient runner, yeah. like continue to get faster. Um, I just like lifting weights too much. <laughs> I, yeah. Maybe it's my ego. I don't know what it is, but no, but you know, it's kept yeah. you pretty injury free though. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I really, yeah. since I started pairing running with lifting intentionally, I, I don't think I've had any kind of significant injuries over yeah. the last like two years or so, which is great. Cause that's obviously, you know, one of the biggest things to, to longevity and continue to build Absolutely. on your marathon time and get faster is just being able to show up. And if obviously you're injured, you can't show up. Yeah. My coach tells me all the time, like the win is getting to the start line. Yep. injury free yep. you know you've gone through 12 to 14 weeks of a lot of mileage a lot of wear and tear and you get to that start line you're you're lucky right. and you're one of the one of the few probably yeah yeah especially for not really running for the first 40 years of your life i yeah. mean i'm sure you did a little bit in sports playing or sports grown up um but not like intentionally running you know dozens of miles a week most people i feel like that would just wreck them so having that probably base strength and, and foundation and physical therapy and and that strong foundation probably helped a lot i would imagine for sure yeah, yeah. um so after your first marathon where do we go from there that was 2021 you said that was 2020 2020 uh, right okay. before covid so we right had a little COVID. there was a little lapse there okay. uh with the races being shut down and different right. things uh i believe the next um official marathon i did was the spring of uh, about a year later 2021 okay. we did one down in waxahachie uh, a friend of mine uh, puts that on. Is that Texas or where's that at? That's Texas. Yeah. Okay. So that's between Waco and, and Fort Worth. Okay. Kind of right there. Um, so we did Waxahachie, then Dallas. Um, and that was where I, I qualified for Boston that second time. I think I was a 308 and that was another race that just wrecked me. So you got a little bit slower. Uh, yeah, I did actually. So yeah, a little bit hillier that time. Okay. Yeah, that's um, true. but, but definitely, um, it was a good race that Dallas puts on a, a great marathon. Yeah. And then you talk, we're talking going into 2022 was when I, I first did Boston. How was that first Boston? It was awesome, man. I mean, that race, you and I have talked about it, but it's so, there's so much around it. There's such a uh, respect level for it yeah. that when you finally get to go onto that course, you realize, you know, the hundred plus years of history of that race and you kind of race it with, it's almost like a surreal out of body, you know, experience. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely, it. Chicago, I, I for some reason thought it was maybe going to feel kind of like Boston, but it's so different. Yeah, I mean Chicago is great. Don't get me wrong, but there's something about the energy at Boston. You can just feel it the whole weekend. Even like everybody's walking around wearing the marathon jackets. The whole mm -hmm. city is like blue and yellow for the the marathon colors, and I mean all the spectators. And you feel like uh like an all star just walking around, knowing that you did the marathon or you're about to run the marathon. Um, yes, yeah, Boston's a cool city in itself, but the marathon weekend is so cool. Yeah. What did you run in Boston? What time? That first time was 312. Um, it's a I, tough course. I was not ready for just the up and down of it. The, yeah. the hills on the back half, especially were, were really tough. Yeah. And, and I, I just hadn't trained enough, uh, on the hills. You guys have a lot of hills down here in Austin, but yeah. where I live, it's hard to get on a lot of hills to prepare for that. So I think that that took its toll and, and it was just, you know, it was a hard course. So yeah. it's not something that you're going to go just PR every time. Yeah, I think it can be a, a really fast course. I mean, that's where the American record was set. Yeah. Uh, the unofficial American record. But it's, uh, yeah, you have to be really strategic, I feel like. Correct. And I, I feel like it's almost impossible to get right your first time. It lulls you It lulls you into it because it's yeah. downhill. Yeah. Uh, the first, really the first half, it's downhill. Yeah. So if you, if you go too hard, your quads are going to be uh be yeah. feeling it towards the second half yeah the downhill can be deceiving because you, sure. you run faster but if you overrun it you're just yeah, your quads get wrecked and i don't think you realize how how much of a beating they take till you get to the uphills and you start yeah. oh my gosh i don't I have nothing yeah. left in my legs yeah uh so is the next marathon 
Boston 2022. Boston 2022, then Chicago 2022. Oh, right. Okay. And I knew it was flat. I, I trained throughout the summer in Texas that, that summer. So that I was, a lot. oh my gosh, training through the summer for a fall marathon is such an underappreciated thing yeah. uh, because in the middle of it, you're just like, gosh, this is, this is brutal. And yeah. you have to heat adjust and you just don't really know, uh, you know, how much it's helping you until you get there. Yeah. And that Chicago, I just absolutely smoked it. it, it we came out and uh, the best I've ever felt, I was shooting for sub three and ended up uh, 251. Holy cow. Uh, so even, you know, I, I was just like at the end, I, I was kept looking at my watch and I had to get to the finish line and call my wife. And I was like, what was the official time? Cause I, I just, yeah. I still didn't, couldn't grasp, uh, you know, what had just happened. That's so amazing. it was pretty crazy. Was the weather pretty similar? Very what, similar. Yeah. Yeah. Mid forties, uh, you know, clear skies. It was, yeah. it was a beautiful day. Yeah, this year Chicago was so great. Yeah, it, it, was, it almost felt exactly the same. That's awesome. Yeah, it's such yeah. a fast course. I I knew it was gonna be fast. I didn't. I'd never run it until this year, but I didn't realize how fast it was actually gonna be. Like, yeah. you, I feel like you don't ever really feel any of the inclines. There's like mm. one or two that I remember, but they're so short. Right. I, obviously, the one was it Mount Roosevelt. Everybody calls it yeah, the last 800 meters. Yeah, that one. I definitely remember that one. Um, but at that point you're like, you're so close. You're like, yeah. okay, just whatever's left in the tank. Yeah. And then, and then you get past the finish line and the, the lady that's putting the medal on me said, they just set the world record. And I was like, yeah, kept them. She said two hours and 35 seconds. And I said, that doesn't surprise me as good as this course felt. Yeah. You know, as good as it felt today. Yeah. I think almost everybody I talked to had a PR that day. Yeah. Yeah. That was a, that was a good day. Um, I want to, about the heat training aspect. I'm curious, your your method or your whatever your coach has you do yeah. to adjust for the heat and, and kind of get through that because it can be miserable sometimes. Sure. And he, he's very similar uh, to what I've seen kind of you do. It's mm -hmm. like 10 to 15 seconds off off yeah. pace. And then really it's dependent on the temperature. So the hotter it is, you know, the more seconds of grace you're going to give yeah. yourself. Do you have a calculator um, that you use to do that? or Yes. And I forgot what it's called. Is it the V dot or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. Calculator. I've used that one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it works great. And it, I want to hear your opinion on this, but like, do you feel like it's for me, it's so hard to build confidence during the summer because you're not ever really running at your true marathon pace. Yeah. You're still doing the workouts. It still feels really hard, but you're still like 20, sometimes 30 seconds a mile slower. And you're like, how am I going to run this much faster for more miles on race day? Like, do, yeah. you, do you find that same thing? And I, that's true. And I think that's easier for, as you get more experience yeah. because you trust the process more yeah. and you know what you can do uh, because you've done it before. And I think that that, you know, as you get more races under your belt and more training cycles, I feel like that gets easier to trust the process, right. but in the moment, it's, it sucks because you can't, you can't go out and run the pace that you know you're going to need to run right. because of the elements, because of the heat. And especially here, I mean, it's just absolutely nuts with the heat and humidity. It's and terrible. Summer. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. brutal. Um, I'm curious to just hear like what you're training. Well, actually, before we go into that, uh, so you did Chicago 2022, 251, where we go from there? Chicago, I did a, I did a marathon called the BCS marathon in Boston, uh, I was going to say Boston College, uh, College Station, okay, uh, right here, uh, close by, and actually ran off the course in that one. Jeremy. Oh no! <laughs> what happened? <laughs> uh, I was I was on pace for a PR. I was uh, at mile seventeen, took a wrong turn. Oh no! So uh, you know, was the course like marked weird, or it was, was it? Yeah, it like was mile not 17 marked brain. well. <laughs> uh, I was not the only person that had that problem. Oh no! Uh, so I wasn't very happy at the moment, yeah. but. I ended up able to finish with a good friend of mine, uh, and, and we finished in 324 together and just had kind of a, you know, a nice moment yeah. there. But I was like, come on, man, this Dude. is, but it's just, you know, you get into a, at that point I'd been used to running really big marathons. So yeah. you, you just turn it on autopilot and follow the people in right. front of you. Uh, in this case, I was by myself. There was two leaders out in front of me. I was in third place, took a wrong turn. Oh, and no. yeah. How far off did you go? I think I went off about two miles, actually. So you yeah, ended like up, 28 miles yeah, or something? Yeah, I ended up over 28. Oh, my yeah. gosh. So you, I, that's my first ultra, though, right? <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> Dude, that's one way of looking at it, yeah. I guess. Oh, my gosh. Hopefully, they've fixed that since then. Yeah, I, I had to talk with some with some people, and yeah. uh, they felt really bad. But 
Oh man, you know, it is what it is. That sucks. Yeah, especially in the moment too, because like you're probably. I mean, you're, if you're top three, you're like, I might be able to win yeah. this thing. I'm gonna have a really good day. Yeah. And that happens. It's hard to not just get eaten up by it. Yeah, and you know when you're running fast at mile 17, 18, you're you're starting to like yeah. one one wrong thing happens and it starts to go off the track. So yep. it's tough. It's tough to come back from yeah. that. Was uh Boston the next race after that? So that was December, and so yeah, Boston would have been would have been the, the next one boston 2023 this past april Dude, you've, and done, you've done so many mar- marathons yeah i've done five i figured it out in my head i've done five in the last 13 months and not just like running them but like racing them so yeah. it's been nice uh you know in the past few weeks to take it take it easy and take a little break but yeah that was yeah. that was boston and the goal was as you and i had talked beforehand was two 245 or yeah. sub 245 and i really felt good Training, I, I trained specifically or intentionally on more hills. Nice. I went over to Fort Worth a lot with my coach, Richard Garcia, and he put me on a lot of hills in the TCU area. And and so we really focused on the hills in the back half of a long run or, yeah. you know, trying to simulate Boston. And so I felt a lot more confident also because it was my second time I'd seen yeah. the course and uh, went went up to Boston and did two, what did I do? 250. So the, the goal wasn't sub 245. It was sub 250. Yeah, I think we had the same goal. Yeah, it was yeah. sub 250. Yeah. So I did 250.04. And you I know, on, Bo- on yeah. Boylston Street, when you can see the clock, <laughs> yeah. and I was like, it's like 249 low. Oh. And I'm just sprinting, dude. And <laughs> and I come in at 250.04, and I was like, oh my gosh. still so happy yeah. you know, with my result. 22 minutes faster than the year before, but that four seconds just four ate seconds. me up. It ate me up. That kind of stuff will keep you up at night. No doubt, dude. <laughs> No doubt. Yeah, I mean, four seconds over the course of two hours and yeah. fifty minutes. I mean, yeah. I'll tell you that. I'm sure you thought it in every way, but I mean, it's like one little right thing here or there. Absolutely, that's such a small amount of time. It adds that's up. Tough. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my first marathon, I was trying to go sub three, and I did three hours and like fifty four seconds. So it was like two seconds a mile I was off by, but yep. four seconds. That's that hurts even more. Yeah. Is it still a PR though, right? So still a PR. So it was huge. it was a minute and change over yeah. Chicago, which on that course I was super yeah. happy with it. Very proud of that. Yeah, that's amazing. And then uh, that was earlier this year, Boston, and then Chicago, right? In Chicago, where we got to hook up and yeah. and run and pace each other for a little bit. That was so much fun. Um, yeah, that was a blast. Yeah, we started off started off great and what do we say first 10 miles basically we did we were able to do side by side yeah yeah i think uh it's so nice being able to run with people especially with oh, somebody you know it yeah. just we didn't really talk too much like yeah. maybe a couple you know yeah. things here or there but we're checking the pace and right. that kind of thing yeah do you find like within maybe the first for me i find within the first like 10k i kind of know how the rest of the day is gonna go yeah do you have a moment in a race where you're like okay today's going to be a good day or we're going to have to grind it out a little bit more than usual. I think though, like you said, those markers, 10 K half marathon, you you know where you're at and you know how yeah. you feel. And you can kind of, once you get more of these under your belt, you can compare how you feel versus what it says on your watch. Right. And so it's easy to kind of see, okay, this, this may be, this may be good. Uh, knowing how much you have left. At what point in Chicago did you know it was going to be a good day and we're going to, we're going to go sub 245. So when two days before the race, or maybe it was a little bit more than that, like a week and a half, um, my coach, Richard Garcia, he, he texts me and he's like, Hey, I got a, I got a bib to Chicago. And I mean, he's, he's training for something else. So he's putting in like 70, 80 mile weeks. Uh, and I'm like, come on, dude. And he goes, I think I'm going to come pace you for the first 10 K. I'm like, sweet, this is, this is perfect. I'll take anything I can get. Cause yeah. I knew, I knew we were going to be running a little bit too. And so I said, yeah, join, join up with me and Jeremy and, and let's, let's do this. So he gets out there and 10 K goes by, then half marathon goes by and then like 16, 17. And I'm, I'm like, he's right next to me, you know? And so this is, this is so nice because Richard, when I'm running with him, it's like, he's my, he's my visual pace. I don't, I really am not checking my watch much. I can just look at him and I know that he's holding the pace. He's, he's way more experienced than I am. I think he's got 25 marathons under his belt or something. Uh, so he's, he is right on it. And we get to mile 20 and he said, Hey, if you do this, you're going to have your, your PR this much in the last 10 K you're going to have your PR. So he dropped back a little bit, but at that point I, I, I knew, I mean, I knew this is, 
this is going to go low. It's just a matter of how low is it going to go. Yeah. Uh, so I was able to uh, to finish strong. Uh, obviously, it's a flat course. It's a fast fast course. Finished strong. Got the two forty three, uh, which again. I'm just like, how is this, how is this <laughs> happening? I mean, I'm, I'm putting in the work yeah. and it's just teaching me trusting the process, being consistent every day, showing up, showing up, doing the workouts, you know, whether they end up, you know, hitting every one or not, you're putting that work in right. and it's going to pay off. Dude, that's huge. Yeah. That's, that journey is so powerful. That's not over yet, I guess, because you just did New York. And then I had later, the bright right? idea. <laughs> I had the bright idea of doing New York 28 days after Chicago, and I I put I put my name into the hat for both of these. I time qualified for both last year uh, with my Chicago and Boston times. Uh, but with New York, the process of getting into the race is so um, it's so difficult because I think. Yeah. Uh, really the race is a lot of New Yorkers that, that run it. So they let them in first and then it's um, whoever can get their time in first with this archaic computer system. Yeah. And so I, I put my name in New York thinking, man, I might not even get in. So I have Chicago as my goal race. New York would be fun just to go run and end up getting into both. Um, so after Chicago, <laughs> I'm thinking, man, I got my PR um, I'm going to see how I feel. Uh, if I, if I'm, if I'm beat up from it, I'm going to just run New York for fun. But if I'm feeling good, you know, I'm, I think I'll go race this thing, uh, which <laughs> I felt good. I yeah. felt good after Chicago, which surprised me, you know, three or four days I was back at it and feeling yeah. pretty good. So, uh, you know, my competitive, the competitive prick that's inside of me was like, <laughs> you got to go race this, man. You can't just go run. The, I mean, you're in New York, yeah. uh, probably one of my favorite cities in the world. So I get there heard about the course. I know that it's, it's not Chicago. It's, it's very hilly, especially in the second half, uh, maybe even more than, than all the other majors. And so I got, got going. I was on my pace. I was probably trying to go for low two fifties. That was my, that was my a goal. Yeah. And four weeks after Chicago, 28 days. Yeah. I'm just going, <laughs> is this smart? We'll find, we'll find out. Uh, so I get into the second half of it and, and I told you, uh, people that try to compare Boston and New York side by side because they're both very hilly. Right. But after after mile 21 on Boston, you fit you've finished the four hills. It's it's a gradual downhill to the finish. Yeah. So you you can kind of coast in uh or speed up if you have the if you have the gas in the tank. After New York, you get to mile mile 20 21. It's it's straight uphill, you know, for <laughs> for the last 5 6 miles. Oh my gosh. And so it's an absolute brutal course. Hardest thing I've ever done. Uh, but it, it was, it was fun. I mean, the crowd support, the, the, you know, the landmarks that you've heard about, you know, you're going over these cool bridges and you, it's, it's just the deafening roar from the crowd. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I think the crowd was the reason I was able to, to do what I did. I finished at 256. Dude. So still, still sub three, which I was happy with, but yeah. man, it felt like I had been through the ringer after that one. That's incredible. Four weeks after a huge PR, still just knocked out a sub three. That's so impressive. Yeah. What, what do you think lets you do that? Like, I mean, I, I know how I felt even a month after Chicago. Like, I I felt like pretty much back to normal, but I'm like, there's no way. I, I At least in my head, I, I couldn't go do a sub three right now. Like, what do you think let you do that? You know, I think it's, it's, that, it's just that competitive fire. It's just yeah. that, you know, I don't want to waste this opportunity maybe. Right. Um, you know, not a lot of people get to go do these races um and i think to go do it well is something that i want to do you know for my family for you know for myself yeah. and it was a maybe more of a pride thing that i you know didn't want to just run it in four hours right. i wanted to go race it that's so cool thing. dude that's so impressive especially again like just reiterating like you just started running four or five years ago yeah and you're, how many marathons in total have you done now so uh, new york was number 10 number 10 yeah new york was number 10 and your first one was early 2020. So right. basically within, from the first one to now, 10 marathons within three years, yeah. less than three years. Yeah. Or I guess less than four, less than four years. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Math. Yeah. Um, dude, I want to dive into your like training methods and, and like what kind of the day to day looks like for that. Cause obviously again, I mean, this in the best way you're a little bit older and like, you, yeah. you're not historically a runner, you know, the first 40 years of your life, you didn't yeah. run like you are now. It's so, like being able to avoid injury, being able to recover fast enough, 
uh, and put in all the big miles and continue to do these back-to-back race efforts. Is there like a secret sauce you've got? Like what's uh, what allows you to do this? You know, it all changed. Um, it all changed when I when I got a coach. I think that's the biggest thing uh, that helps a lot of people is that you have someone that's more experienced than you. They've been in those situations and they can kind of guide you through these beginning stages when you're just learning how to, you know, simple things like getting ready for a race. What do you eat the week before a race? You know, how do you recover? You know, recovery is the the number one thing right now. If you can do that well, uh, you can line up every day, you can be consistent, and you can stay healthy. So finding Richard, who we met through a mutual friend, and he's just a you know, not only is my he and my coach, he's one of my best friends. And so we, we talk on a weekly basis and his philosophy was the aerobic base. You yeah. try to build that up as much as you can before you even step on a track to do speed work, before you ever start doing marathon pace miles. So he took me from doing everything at marathon <laughs> yeah. pace miles yeah. to doing a lot of base miles. Yeah. And so we took a huge block of time, like maybe three, four months before I did that first Boston. And he just had me do everything easy. And that was very hard for me because I'm out there jogging around and these people are blowing by me. And again, that's my yeah. pride. That's my competitive spirit. And, and I'm like, I can't, I can't do a 10 mile run at nine minutes a mile. I, yeah. That's what I told him. And he said, well, you're you're not going to get faster if you don't you got to build these miles but still be able to recover right. still be able to line up the next day and do the same thing because we're going to have you up to 80 miles a week and so i guess that building that aerobic base and learning how to be patient mm-hmm. with the miles how to be you know satisfied with going out and running 2 to 3 minutes slower than you think your marathon pace yeah, is yep. that's so huge yeah it takes i think more discipline to do that every day it's so easy to go out and just run as hard as you can or right. run at your marathon pace. Yeah. I think that's easier. Um, definitely requires a lot of patience and discipline. What What's your typical, like, do you, do you run at a certain pace? Or you say, today I'm going to do nine minutes a mile for these miles. Or do you run off of heart rate or just strictly off a of feel or what's that look like? Yeah, a lot of mine is off a of feel. Okay. And it normally, my easy miles end up be, <laughs> being between 830 to, to 9, 915. Yeah. And that's, that's where I've found that it just feels good the next day like i can get out and do 10 miles one day 12 the next eight the next and so that's been a good kind of area that we can you know my or pace wise that we that we keep it how long did it take you to develop that feel for like this is what my easy day pace should feel like did was it at first maybe doing heart rate and kind of using that or or how did you go started out doing heart rate exactly and having like a you know, something to look at, you know, you're looking at a number, yeah. uh, trying to keep it down. But that was frustrating for me because my heart rate is, um, historically just, it just jumps up when I'm running. Like yeah. it's high. Like you'll look at some of my marathons on Strava and it's like, Hey, you're averaged 190 yeah. during the race. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, how am I still alive? You yeah. know, <laughs> but I felt okay. Yeah. So, you know, you have a resting heart rate of 40 and a, and a, and a max yeah. heart rate of 200, <laughs> but I guess that's good. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, when you first started training zone two, was your heart rate pretty high? Is it, has it gone down since then? Like it has, easy pace? it has slowly, it has slowly gone down. Yeah. Uh, and then I just kind of went with feel Richard. He's a lot more about feel than he is about yeah. numbers. And I think that's why he's been so successful is that he really can go out, do a run all by feel and, and you yeah. know, know what it's supposed to feel like. So yeah, I think there's a lot of power to going out for a run and not looking at your watch and just going strictly off of feel i think there's so much power to that absolutely absolutely the other thing you know once we had the aerobic base uh that he he taught me was uh, these long runs with certain miles at marathon pace so you're going out you're doing whether it's two by three intervals intervals or four by four or just going out and doing a you know 18 mile long run with 12 at marathon pace and just really fitting getting a feel for that you know, what is this marathon pace supposed to feel like? And then on top of that, throwing in some tempo to where marathon pace feels a little bit easier. So all those things I learned. And as I did, I just saw the, I just saw the results very, very quickly. Yeah. There's definitely a formula to marathons um, because it's, it's so dependent upon like your lactate threshold for the most part. Um, and if you can sit like right under that lactate threshold, for your marathon like that's that's right where you want to be right um that's what i think makes those elite runners so good is they're like they can I, i've talked to zach bitter about this you know him he's like a 
an elite ultra runner. I've um, seen him with you, yeah. Yeah, and he talks about how like Kipchoge and Kiptum, they can ride that line down to like one to two seconds a mile slower than their lactate threshold. Um, and they're just right on the cusp. They've, they've dialed it in so closely that that's what allows them to go so fast. Obviously, they've got some other factors there, but that's the cool thing about marathons, I think, is it's it's so data-driven and scientific, really, when you get down to it, that um, you can really dial in like your training paces. And, okay, if you can do this many intervals at this distance, at this pace, then you can run this time for a marathon, yeah. roughly, which is cool. Um, it's crazy yeah. that Richard or – you know, people that know this sport, they can predict based on your workouts, yeah. you're probably going to be within this for the marathon. And he's right. never been wrong yeah. uh, on mine. So it, you're right. It's, it's so data driven. It's so down to the second yeah. uh, as far as, you know, what people are capable of based on what they're right. doing in training. Yeah. It's even crazy. Like on race day, if you go out five, eight seconds a mile too fast, that seems so insignificant. Like 5200 feet in a mile right if you show up five seconds too soon you do that a couple of times like you're probably gonna blow up at the end yeah because uh, again you're always right on that line of like lactate threshold um dang i love that that's so cool uh what about uh like your strength training routine what does that kind of look like in in compare or uh, in conjunction with your running so i try to do that three times a week i love kettlebells yeah i love to get those out and follow a lot of your videos and just different things that I can incorporate. Uh, just fo really hitting on the glutes, on the core, um, trying to hit the hip flexors. Yeah. These things that, you know, if you were going out to lift weights to look good, you wouldn't do these, yeah. but these are so vital for, for yeah. runners. Um, I've talked to several people just from a physical therapy point of view with knee pain, whether they're running or not. But a lot of times it's those weak glutes that we never focus on. Yeah. Uh, they're so important to to what we do because running is a single, you know, leg exercise. And yeah. your your glutes, man, if if they can carry the load, um, you're gonna stay you're gonna stay pretty well fit and healthy and feel good uh, when you're showing up every day to run. Yeah. What about? Um, I mean, as a physical therapist, you probably describe this better than me, but I know so much of strength training is you're just like activating the nerves. Right. Yeah. And so from what I know, uh, one of the reasons, again, the glutes, I think are one of the main things for runners is because maybe people don't have weak glutes. It's just, they're not activated. Like the nerves aren't activated in your body and your mind can't make that connection to like rely more on your glutes and you're overemphasizing your quads or something mm -hmm. else. Uh, is that true? Like, do you know much about that side of things? Um, that's a little deeper than, yeah. than I, probably have researched or study, but yeah. it, I mean, it makes sense. I mean, every muscle is nerve driven, right. innervated by a nerve. So I think that, you know, trying to get that neural pathway and, and, yeah. and muscle, muscle connection is, is very important. Yeah. What, uh, what are some exercises you do, uh, like on a typical leg day? Oh man. Uh, just squats, goblet squats with yeah. the kettlebell, kettlebell swings, uh, deadlift, Again, not nearly as heavy as, <laughs> as you do, uh, but those just yeah. really hitting those, yeah. you know, any way that I can hit the glutes without, um, you know, not being able to show up to run the next day. Right. That's, that's my goal. And and I don't spend more than 30 minutes at a time yeah. doing strength training. That's huge. I, yeah. people, I think assume you got to spend 90 minutes in the gym. Yeah. It doesn't take that long. No, it doesn't. I mean, you do it 30 minutes, most yeah. minor 30 to 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. They can be quick and easy. Uh, I mean, you mentioned like maybe three or four exercises. You probably do those same exercises every, every week, right? Yeah. I don't change it up a lot. Yeah. Um, I do, I don't do a lot for upper body pull. I love pull-ups. I think yeah. it's a, you know, for, that gets everything, uh, chest, shoulders, back. Um, so those, those combination exercises that so you don't have to spend so much time isolating right. everything. Those are so important. Yeah. I think the functionality is huge. Absolutely. And doing those different compound movements and mm -hmm. yeah. I like doing curls sometimes just to try and look good. But. Hey, dude, we all do. We all do curls. I mean, yeah. we're outside. I, I joke around when I'm around, when I'm at my, at my house. I don't wear a shirt, so yeah. you got to have you know you got to keep. Those of course, up a little you got to yeah. look good too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think it just feels good to like go in and maybe occasionally work out like a bodybuilder, just get a good pump sure. once in a while. But I think making the functional movements the priority. Yeah, is key. Yeah. Um, and is that all kettlebell that you use, or do you use any barbells, any dumbbells, no, or all kettlebell. strictly kettlebells? Yeah, I'd I'd love to have a setup, you know, like you got. I want to look at that in a little while, but the yeah, we'll go uh, check it out. After yeah, this. the uh, the gym there. But that's the goal. Yeah, is to keep it simple. I have a small room that I kind of keep everything in. Yeah. A few dumbbells, a few kettlebells, uh, and that's that's it. I love that. Again, I don't think you have to overcomplicate it. No, I mean. Even with kettlebells, like you could have 
like one or two kettlebells and sure. do all those things. Absolutely. Like you don't have to have a whole rack of them and this whole home gym, like yeah. you can just have a couple pieces of equipment and do so you much. You know, and you'd be surprised at how much of a workout you can get from a lighter, you know, a yeah. lighter kettlebell. I think mine are 35 and 40 and it doesn't take much once you're activating those, those muscles right. to get them going. Uh, so yeah, it doesn't take the, the heavy, yeah. you know, crazy type of equipment. That's great. Do you ever, uh, do you get sore after doing those or is it like, okay, maybe before I ask that, what's like typical like rep scheme? Do you stick to like six to 10 reps or what's that kind of look like? I try to do, yeah, six to 10, six to 10 reps, like four to five sets of okay. each, of each exercise. Yeah. yeah. And does that leave you sore ever? Like, I know you said you, you do it to where you can still run the next day, yeah. but do you, do you ever feel sore from any of that? Never, like a little bit, but never bad enough to where it affects, you know, yeah. daily life or running. Yeah. So, Do you think that that, I mean, it's kind of like active recovery in a way sure. uh, for running too. Do you think that that additional strength training helps kind of get the blood flowing and, and prevent a lot of the, the soreness that could come from running maybe? I love I love doing it like, I know that you do the same thing after a big speed day or a big yeah. long workout. Get in there and, and, and work out, do a little strength training because not only does it help strengthen that muscle to get that blood flowing, but also stretches the muscle right. and it's very good active recovery. So I, I'm very big in that, um, yeah. getting out, walking after a long run, uh, all these different things are, are important because you don't want that, uh, that muscle soreness to creep in because sometimes it can be delayed till the next day. Right. Yeah. I think active recovery for me has been one of the biggest things. I always say motion is lotion. <laughs> yeah. Movement is medicine. I tell, yeah. I tell my patients that all the time, um, because uh, I work in an orthopedic hospital and they just had, you know, a surgery on their knee or their hip or their back. And the last thing they want to do is move around, but that's what our bodies are made to do. We're yeah. made to move. Uh, that's the way that God made us. And if we don't move, you start losing that range of motion. You start losing that strength. So movement is medicine, you know, more even so than, a pharmaceutical pill that you can take it's so the, our body yeah. is made to heal itself and that's through blood flow that's for through movement and it's a it's a huge huge thing to remember yeah i just last night on the podcast i had um this guy who works for morton like the the gels and the fuel and he lived in kenya with a lot of the elite runners and trained with them for a while and he said when they're because they're all farmers and stuff growing up right. and that translates so well and that's a big reason why they can run so fast is because their bodies are just always moving mm -hmm. so they have really strong joints and ligaments and their muscles have a lot of endurance because they're just constantly moving yeah. i think unfortunately so many people i mean I, I i i'm guilty of it too just like you go for a run and then you just sit at a desk all day it's right. you got to be really intentional i think to get out and walk and strength train and just keep your body moving as much as possible absolutely all these different things factor into the whole picture yeah. you know being a great runner is not just going out and running fast it's it's the maintenance it's the things when you're not running um and and it's it's so important to to stay on top of everything as a whole yeah. because it can make you better what about your uh your diet and nutrition um maybe on like a day-to-day -day basis plus i'm curious to hear how you fuel for runs too so this, this isn't something that you probably want to go to me for advice on. <laughs> I have three, I have a 10 year old and then twins that are eight years old and we have a lot of cookies and, and snacks around the house. And, and my fueling strategy is just, you know, eat what's there. My wife, uh, Stacy is an incredible, uh, baker. So she, she bakes a lot, uh, banana breads, uh, oh, chocolate nice. chip cookies. So my, uh, my fuel of choice for marathons is pretty much that kind of stuff. I do think if I really dialed into nutrition, I think that that's another, another thing that I could get a lot better at. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've talked to certain people about that two weeks prior to a marathon. I try to dial back on, um, you know, sugar and, and different things to try to right. eat a little bit cleaner. But as far as, you know, what you, some of you guys are doing, I think that it's, that's a, that's an area that I could really improve on. Yeah. I, for me, it's mostly just how I feel. I think the, the nutrition side of things. Uh, I can just tell if I eat like a lot of processed stuff, a lot of sugar, sure. things with like the seed oils and canola oil, all that stuff. I just feel tired and low energy and like brain doesn't feel right. Yeah. Um, do you ever feel any of that? Or like you'd feel like, I mean, obviously you, I'm probably you do just, it a little bit, so. <laughs> just used to that, <laughs> that feeling. Uh, no, I, I think that that that's that's very good advice i think that you know monitoring that kind of stuff trying to keep your body at its optimal level right. uh is very important now that doesn't mean to to cut calories or, or things like that because obviously right. we burn a lot of calories in this training and running so yeah. uh just being sensible about you know what you're putting in 
yeah. because it, it is a machine that's going to take you to the right. finish line. Yeah, I think it's there's a balance to it also. It's like you can't be so strict with everything True. all the time. you got to have some balance. Like It's like running, like 80-20 rule. I think yep. that can apply to nutrition too. Like yep. 80% of the time, eat pretty good, eat pretty clean, and then have some banana bread or some chocolate chip cookies. Right. It's not going to kill you. Um, yeah, I love that. What about uh, your fueling strategy for racing? Fueling strategy for racing has come a long way. Like I was telling you at the beginning, I didn't do much. Um, for Chica- even even up to that first time I ran Chicago, I took one gel oh and drank uh, just drank like one every five k, like a cup of. And you still ran? Was it 251? 251. Oh my gosh! <laughs> so Richard has um, uh, my coach has chastised me plenty of times that like we got to work on this man. <laughs> like you can't you can't keep running these marathons yeah. with no fuel. So I think I'm up to. I still think I'm up to like three gels, um, but that's that's it. I mean, and I've and I've recently, like in the past uh, past six months, started doing electrolytes during the day, um, throughout the day, and that's I've really felt a difference in that as far as especially training through the summer, um, staying hydrated. How much better you feel when you have that electrolytes, um, you know, in your system because you're losing so much sodium and so much sweat. Um, so that's, that's definitely been a a big boost for me. Um, the race nutrition, I just, I have to keep experimenting (laughs) with it. Uh, how many gels do you take during a race? Uh, Chicago is actually a weird one. I was, I usually plan in total six for the day, but I think I only end up taking like three or four just cause I, when you're running that fast, it's so hard, yeah. like because you're breathing so hard to get them in. Uh, my stomach was fine, but I think I, I ended up only taking like three. I think. Yeah. So the uh, the so plan was what one every four miles. Basically. Yeah. 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 Well, I see. You know, you see these people too. They line up to the race. They got their belt. They got ten yeah. gels in it. And I'm like, am I missing out here? But <laughs> but I've you know I've, I've made it through without them. And I'm right. the same. I'm kind of the same way as far as getting it down yeah it's not it's not hurting my stomach but it's just the process and we're, we're breathing like crazy trying to right. get that oxygen yeah. and it's hard to to eat while you're running or even something as simple as a gel right yeah i want to experiment more with uh it's harder because i know i don't want to say like the must be nice to be an elite but they do have like their tables where you can yeah. they have like their dedicated water bottles and so i know most elites don't really use gels i think they just stick liquid. to at least during a race. Yeah, they just do liquid calories, um, so that's more convenient. And I'm trying to figure out a way if there's a if there's a way to do that during a race because you can only carry so much liquid with you. Right. Obviously, like again, that the guy I had on from Morton. That's a it was a really good episode. Um, you you might want to check that one out in terms of fueling. I should call that guy. Yeah. Like, yeah. What do I need to do here? Yeah, because he he just he talked about all about the science and everything going into fueling and like if your carb depleted like you have yeah. nothing left in the tanks your body's trying to use fat and you can't go as fast on fat but obviously you've been able to make it work so I'll stack my banana bread up against his yeah. gels any day. <laughs> maybe you're a, you're an anomaly who knows they need to we you need get you in know. a lab and study you <laughs> yeah do that blood work on me <laughs> yeah um do you carb load at all i just eat a little more than you but my my take on on carb loading is during a taper um you're running so much less yeah. than you normally do. So if you just eat like you normally do, I'm kind of, I'm good. I'm good yeah. with that. Um, but yes, I think to some extent you're going to yeah. eat a little bit more, but I mean too much. I'd, I'd feel like yeah. the, the Goodyear blimp running out there. I yeah. Mean, it's, it's hard. Yeah, that is. Uh, oh, the dogs are active. They're doing something. <laughs> they want to play. <laughs> yeah. Um, they heard Harris talk about all this food probably. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I uh, what was I gonna say carb loading. Yeah, I it, you definitely feel bloated sometimes. It, it, a lot of it depends on what carbs you're eating. Obviously, like if you're doing a lot of pasta and bread, that could be challenging. But um, I, for me, I know from how I felt my first marathon, I didn't carb load at all. To now, more recently, doing like a f- proper three day carb load of like 600 grams of carbs yeah. per day. Uh, I feel like I just I don't ever really hit that wall in the race, which is nice. Have you have you hit that like in Chicago? Did you ever hit a point where you're like I've got nothing left in the tank. Or did you feel like pretty consistent all the way throughout? I felt very consistent uh, during that race, particularly or both Chicago's and then the last yeah. Boston. But I have I have hit the wall uh, that first race, and yeah. then actually in New York a couple of weeks ago, it was interesting. It was definitely a wall. I don't know if it was more um, lack of carb loading or just just being right, just tired. Yeah. You know, Dude, that was you're like patient zero. I feel like you're like the first. <laughs> 
person to like have very little carbs and still just crush in these races. Yeah. I wonder, I'd be curious, uh, like if you, maybe as like an experiment, really just like overload the carbs, carb load, bunch of gels and stuff and see how yeah. you feel. If you, if you notice any kind of difference. Yeah. Cause I mean, obviously you're doing some carbs, but it sounds like not as much as definitely as much as I do, which is so interesting. No. I wouldn't have guessed that. You have it down to a science. I mean, you, you got the... I have to if you, I want to run this it? fast you're too. The, you're counting the carbs and the, the macros? Is that what it is? Yeah, so I have like the... an app. Uh, it's called Macros First where I track everything. Um, tip for my like height, weight, age, everything, it's like 600 grams of carbs per day for three days. Yeah. Um, I think you're a little bit taller than me, so mm -hmm. it might be a little bit different. But uh, yeah. Dude, if I want to run as fast as you, I have to. I have to get everything dialed in. I can't just go out and wing it like you are. <laughs> you know, uh, winging it—that's that's that's a good way to put it. I mean, that's how I felt a lot of the times, but yeah, uh, have felt good. That's amazing, man. Um, what about like? I guess we talked about recovery a little bit. Uh, do you prioritize? I know you have kids and a wife and a family and a full-time job. How, what about sleep? Like, do you? prioritize sleep and, and try and get as many hours in as you can because i know that could be tough yeah with all that else all sleep, those other things going on sleep has always been very important for me i think i'm a person who's who requires more like seven to eight is my goal yeah. uh, every night so staying out late those days are way beyond um but when i was yeah when my kids were little like babies especially having twins at, at one point it, the sleep was was not there so i was probably really lucky that i wasn't running at that point because right. I don't, I don't think I could have uh, kept it up yeah. as far as just not sleeping through the night, waking up multiple times, uh, just a lot of responsibility when the kids are so small. Yeah. Um, but How old now, are they now? Uh, oldest is 10, Bryce, and then Colby and Caleb are eight. And they actually, we've talked about, they share your birthday. Oh, September yeah. 17th? September 17th. No way. It's a good day. That's amazing. Good day. Yeah, but they're, uh, they're, cool. they're good boys. They, they love to run as well. Um, I have them doing 5Ks oh. and they, oh they all three play baseball and football. So that's incredible. Um, that's another thing about this running. It's like one of the things that helps me line up every time is that I know my, my boys are watching and yeah. they see their dad go out and do something hard. They see him go out and set a goal and shoot for it. Whether I get it or not, they're seeing me strive for it. Um, I get up at five every morning to go run so I can be home before they wake up and help them get ready for school. So it's that, it's just that daily discipline. It's that daily mentality of I'm going to show up, I'm going to get this done yeah. and, and, you know, strive for these, these great things. And I think that's a great thing to set for your kids because they yeah. see you do those things <laughs> and it's like, man, dad can do it. I can do it. Yeah. So do you think that's, that's uh, on those days where you're like, I don't want to get out of bed and go run 10 miles this morning. Is that, what keeps you going is is like knowing your kids are watching, your family's watching, depending on you to, you know, not not that it matters if you're going to go run a marathon or not, but like setting that example. Do you think no, that's kind of that why? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That's the biggest thing. And uh, I have a couple guys that that live about a mile from me, uh, Jeff Baker, David and Jay, and they we normally meet every day. And as you said earlier, it's, it's easier to run with with people. Yeah. Uh, so in the morning we'll get out there and we'll, we'll talk about life's problems and we'll pray for each other and we'll talk, uh, you know, talk about different things uh, going on with our families. And so it's a, it's a huge blessing for me yeah. to get out there with those guys. And also you're getting up at 5 a.m. You need some accountability. Yeah. Uh, so to, to answer your question, if it was just me by myself, there may be days that I would turn over and, you know, go back to sleep for another hour, but yeah. you know, getting up to meet those guys, it's, uh, it's important to me. Yeah, that definitely helps. And it's, having that like camaraderie with it too even if you're training for different races or whatever it's uh it's so nice to just have other people to share that journey with oh, i for think sure. and i think some of my favorite conversations ever are out on a long run oh with, yeah with close friends uh because you like you're so vulnerable because there's there's nothing else to do you can either just run in silence or you talk yeah and at some point you know in a 10 mile run like you kind of run out of things to talk about so you gotta get a little bit more personal which is cool yeah and those are, those are two of the biggest things i would tell somebody that's starting to run Go slow, as we talked about. Yeah. Slower than you think you can, and then find somebody to do it with. And it's like it's like you said, it's like you can have your own little podcast every day, or just have conversations. You learn so much about people. Running has opened up so many relationships with me that I would have never had otherwise. Right. You know, this one being one of them. But yeah. um, you know, it's it's a way to uh, to talk to people, to get to know people, and uh, you know, pray with people. And so it's something that. I'm very blessed to have in my life. I love that. How yeah. do you balance all of this? Obviously, it's a lot. Do you, is your job like 40 hours a week, uh, physical yeah. therapy? 
you got three kids, a wife. I'm sure you have a social life with friends and everything. Plus stack on marathon training, which is a part-time job in itself. Uh, plus the strength training, even when you factor right. that, and it's a it's a lot of things to balance. How do you go about that? It's a it's 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 tough. It really is, especially when you're in those eighty mile weeks. Is but, that what you peak at? That's what I peak at. Holy cow! 80. I gotta catch up to you. Come on, man. You're close. I need more banana bread. That's what <laughs> that's <it is>. right. <laughs> we can send you some. Um, but yeah, it's I mean, you make time for the things that are important to you. Um, you know, my faith uh, in Christ is, is number one, so important. Uh, it's, it's, it's who I am. I wouldn't be anywhere without, you know, uh, my faith in Christ. And then, you know, Stacy, the boys, uh, you make that family time. And then as I was telling you, getting up, you, you know, if you have to get up at 5 a.m. to do it, some, I'd love to run maybe when I get home from work, but yeah. man, there's other things going on. So you make time for those things that need to get done and you just try to to balance it. Some weeks are going to be better than others. Some right. weeks we got a million different practices or uh, rehearsals or things to go to, or, or Stacy's out of town traveling, whatever it is. But some some weeks you're just you're going to be right on it, you yeah. know, where everything fits in and and planning those things out too. The beginning of the week, yeah, you, know, you plan these things and you, and that helps to to kind of organize and make time for it. Yeah, yeah, that's I think the easiest excuse that a lot of people make unfortunately is like oh i have kids i have a job i don't have time to train for a marathon i don't have time to strength train in addition to training for a marathon like i just don't have time but i mean i love hearing stories from people like you that's like you have so much going on and you make it all work right and it's um yeah i don't i don't really know there's a secret sauce to it it's just like you show up you prioritize the things that are important uh i would imagine you probably don't watch a lot of tv or you don't spend six hours a day on your phone scrolling through Instagram. Right. Uh, and you just, you become really intentional with your time, it sounds like. You do. And and that's that's so important because time is the most valuable asset we have. Yeah. And if you if you have a mindset of you're going to squeeze every ounce out of every day, uh, yeah. that's, you know, that's, that's what you, that's what you can do. Yeah. I love that, dude. You're killing it, man. I'm excited to see where we keep going. That, that's the other impressive thing is like, obviously, you just got into it you know, within the last few years and you're continuing to get faster and faster and faster. What's your, uh, what's your like ultimate goal with all this? You know, you've heard of the guy, Ken Rideout. He's the, yep. he's the world champion masters runner. He's the world champion over 50. Now he's, I think he's getting closer to his mid fifties, but the guy is just crazy fast. And he said that he he's PR'd every year for the last 15 years. So I guess That's he was nuts. 35 when he started really running competitively and yeah. now he's i guess over 50 but uh that's the goal man i want to pr every year i want to go to run the, the six uh world marathon majors i'm going to find out hopefully in the next few days that i'm going to be in berlin in september yeah um, so you've done the three u.s ones so the three far, u.s right? were this year and then a couple the year before so five majors total so far but i've done a couple you know boston chicago multiple times yeah. i'd love to i'd love to be in london and tokyo here soon but yeah, just, just competing. I mean, you hear all the time that people want to compete against the clock. Running is competing against yourself. Well, it is to some degree, but I also want to beat the guy next to me. I want to yeah. beat the guy in front of me. And, and I think that competitive competitiveness that I have, uh, it lends to, you know, just making me work harder yeah. because I know there's somebody out there that's better. I mean, Ken right out, he's 50 two fifty three he's faster than me that gets on my nerves yeah dude. so you know i want to keep getting faster <laughs> and i want people to to know that hey he may be he may be gray-headed and old but <laughs> the guy can run so i think there's so much potential left still which is so cool because i think you can see like obviously within just a few years you've made so many gains and you can yeah, I mean, I, I could easily see you going, you know, 230s, sub 230 eventually even. I don't know what your ultimate goal is time-wise, but, like, just keep getting faster and faster. Um, yeah, once I think, you know, you figured out the, like, easy running piece. That was another big boost. Maybe, like, the next is nutrition or, like, the next. Like, there's always something to work on, too. And I think um, that coupled with the consistency and the work and just showing up day after day after day, um, I'm so excited to see where it ends up for you. Yeah, I am too. And it's a, it's a fun, it's a fun sport because like you said, you can, you can compete and get better and you can see yeah. those results every day. Yeah. Like, Oh, I'm better than yesterday. I'm better than last week. This race was better than that one. And that's such a easy thing to see. And I think that's, that's what makes it so much fun. Yeah. Do you want to do uh, anything past 
marathon distance. I know we kind of chatted about it this morning when we were running, but maybe like ultras or Ironmans or any kind of other <clears throat> endurance events. Ironman has always been on the radar. Um, I don't have a, a huge background in swimming, which would be, again, a challenge that I would love to, yeah. to tackle. Swimming's uh, tough. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I sink yeah. like a rock. Yeah. It's I mean, it, it can really, it can really work against you if you don't know what you're doing. Right. So it's a lot of technique. It would be, a, it would take a lot of work to, to get to that level, but to finish one of those would be really, really cool. Um, I think that the ultra marathon or, you know, hundred K yeah. an uh, intentional ultra marathon, not an accidental, right. <laughs> not, not running off the course and going too far like an idiot. Um, but yeah, an intentional ultra maybe something maybe i could tag along on one of these in, yeah. in the mountains that'd be fun heck yeah dude ultras are fun it's uh I, I was telling you this morning it's they're more enjoyable than a marathon i think but marathons are more fun i don't know if it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense but uh in my head it makes sense because it's i don't know how to how to describe it it's it's with ultras like you can walk if you want you can hike you can sit down for a minute you can eat you can sit down and eat a quesadilla if you want right um it's less pressure uh but it's I think way more mentally challenging, whereas a marathon is way more physically challenging. Yeah. Um, and that's why, I mean, even like in these 200 mile races and stuff, there's people out there like in their 60s, 70s, because it's all about just keep moving forward. You're never really going that fast. But if you're just always making forward progress, that's what's going to get you to the finish line. And it's uh, it's cool to see that. Um, that's what I love about running so much is it just teaches you all these different um, mental strength things and, and how to endure. I mean, obviously... Hence the word endurance. It's uh, it's mostly mental, I think, which is cool. Do you? That's another question I had. Do you do any kind of like mental strength training or anything to to kind of work on that? You know, last ten k of a marathon, that mindset you have to go into to get through that. I think the the only thing that would be similar to what you're talking about is just putting yourself in that position. So, you know, go run twenty miles and run the last five or six at marathon pace. You know, to yeah. wear your legs out and then go fast fast finish we like to call it so uh that's that's definitely a mentally um strengthening uh yeah. exercise when you know that you're gonna have to tackle this on tired legs or or running the day after a long run like do a fast run something yeah. like that um but yeah that's that's kind of what i would compare to that do you do any kind of like meditation or anything that would maybe outside of running to to work on like the mental side of things or is it just uh kind of just the day-to-day -day life you've got enough going on that that, that yeah. that'll do it you know running has been a it's such an escape from the day-to-day -day life yeah. you know our lives are busy i mean yeah let alone work but uh you know having a family a lot of responsibilities that come with that and putting my phone down for that hour or hour and a half in the morning that i go run yeah and just being able to if i'm by myself just pray or uh, be in my thoughts or if i'm with a buddy just to have a conversation which is crazy but people don't do that anymore right. uh you know people barely talk on the phone so having that that contact with someone else or if you're by yourself uh has is such a huge huge mentally a stimulating thing for me yeah. uh, because we do get on our phones and it's you know, no matter how hard you try that thing is grabbing your attention and so having that break uh, for that time that you're running that's why i purposefully don't listen to music i don't carry my phone that's my next question do you ever listen to music no absolutely not i you know most of the time i run it's in the dark and so i've been chased by dogs i've uh <laughs> you know had run-ins with traffic and so I think the safety part was what initially had me put the music down. Yeah. But then I just enjoyed it. And yeah. I, I don't know what I would do with music in my ears. It would be so weird. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think the running without music or without stimulation, it's like a whole new level to running. So yeah. I, I, and there's nothing wrong with it, but I think a lot of people, they get into running and they got to have a podcast. They got to have music. And I used to be that way too. And then once I got rid of all that and I just went out and ran with no devices, no phone, no music, no headphones or anything, it's like a whole new experience basically. Yeah. No, there's, there's no question. That's the best way to do it. I know, yeah. I know people would argue with that, but I mean, there's a reason when you go to these big races and people are, you know, they tell new runners, don't put your stuff away because you need yeah. to soak it all in. And that's, yeah. you know, even if you're not at Boston or not at one of these uh, marathons, you can still listen to the world around you and soak in a run no matter where you're at. Right. I mean, you'll, you'll see stuff you've never seen before. Yeah. Uh, so waiting to hear about, do you have a spring marathon or Boston? Boston. Okay. Yeah. Done. So I'm, I'm pacing a, a buddy of mine in Miami. Actually, there's three or four of us that are going to run in January. Uh, the Miami marathon. Right. And I think they're oh, shooting for like 
three thirty, four hours. So it'll be it'll be fun time with them. Yeah, uh, it's a great it's a great race, great city. Uh, but the next goal race will be Boston. So you're uh, gonna race Boston? I'm gonna race it, man. We're gonna see Ooh. if we can uh, get a PR, a Boston PR. I don't know about a. I don't know about a lifetime PR. We'll see. Who knows, man? Hearing your story, I'm like, this guy's going to go like 239 in Boston or something. <laughs> man, that'd be something. Have you, uh, do you have like a goal time in mind? Is it, is it really just to, to get a Boston PR or are you like, I want to do 239 or what, what do you think? Right now it's it's the Boston PR, 240s, anywhere in the, even yeah. the high 240s. I think yeah. that would be a successful training block. And um, and then hopefully in Berlin, we'll, yeah. Berlin would probably be where I would try to set up a pretty steep goal. Yeah, dude. Yeah. I'm excited to hear that. Hopefully you get into Berlin. Yes, I hope so yeah. too. That's It'll a be fun. good flat, fast course from what I know. Yeah, it's the 50th running of it. It's going to be, you know, really cool. I've never been to Germany, so that'll be fun to take the family and, yeah. and have some fun. That'll be awesome. We went not to Berlin, but we were in Munich, like the southern part of Germany, mm-hmm. uh, about a year ago. And it's it's so cool over there. Yeah, it's, I think I haven't run an international marathon, but I've heard it's just a blast because it's like part vacation park sure. going to run a marathon sure yeah cool. you got to take some you got to take some time off for that yeah dude um thank you for coming on actually last question if somebody is listening to this what would you recommend to them like if they're maybe a new runner or somebody considering getting into running maybe they're even a little bit older and they're like oh, i'm past my prime i'm too old to get into running i'm i'm, I'm not going to be able to pick it up and you know make any kind of gains what would you say to them or what, what kind of tips would you give them you know first of all i would say it's never too late um, I was 40 years old and, and yes, I had some background in athletics, but nothing, nothing close to endurance sports. So it's never too late. Um, I think anyone can get into running and immediately see progress, immediately see gains. Uh, and the second thing I would say is get a coach, you know, whether it's a friend like I have, whether it's somebody like you that, that they can hire, but the coach or someone with more experience than them, that's going to make the biggest difference because you can start off on the right foot, on the right track, unlike I did. I probably ran yeah. three marathons before I was like, had any idea what was, you know, what the right way to do it. Um, so start off um, training correctly, I think is a great, a great way to do that. And I think getting a coach is probably the, the quickest way to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Hopefully skip all the, uh, the failures and the hardships that you would have to endure without a coach. Yeah. Yeah. I love that, man. Thanks for coming on, dude. If anybody wants to connect with you, where would be the best place to do that? Yeah. Just, uh, send me a message on Instagram. The best is yet to run. Uh, that's, that's where I'm at. And what's the meaning behind that? I'm glad you asked. Uh, I grew up, uh, my church, my family, kind of the motto was to God be the glory and the best is yet to come because, no matter what, our faith in Christ uh, has us to where uh, the the best is always ahead of us because we have that uh, to look forward to uh, to being with Him um, after we're in this life. And uh, if you believe in Jesus, uh, you will um, be with Him. And so the best is yet to run. Just kind of adopted from that. Best is yet to come. Best is yet to run uh, into my my running uh, experiences that. Um, that running is such a valuable thing, whether it's mentally, whether it's physically, uh, but you get so much out of it that no matter where you're running, no matter how far you're running, no matter if it's a race or if you're stepping out of your back door to go run, the best is yet to run. I love that, dude. It's always so much more than just running. Absolutely. Yeah. It's such a great sport. It's like, it's like a blank canvas to like tell stories and like experience different things in life. I don't know. Running so great. I love it. It brings you together with so many people. Yeah. Um, it challenges you personally, but I mean, without running, I wouldn't have met so many of my friends. Yeah. Um, wouldn't have met you. I mean, there's just so many ways that running can connect you because the community is so large and the people in the running community are genuinely so kind and so nice and they want to help. They want to help other runners. And yeah. I think that's a that's a beautiful thing to say about it. Yeah. Do you plan on uh, doing, like creating content, like putting yourself out there more, doing Instagram, anything like that? Gonna, you've got, you got a cool story to, to share with people. Uh, you know, I'd love to. I, I see people like you and I just don't know how you do it. I know you work so hard at it and a lot of hours per week. And I don't, uh, I don't see myself being anywhere near you, sir. Uh, but I would like to put out... Uh, more videos, just different things. Um, you know, maybe it's of some value to someone, but, uh, yeah. I'm going to get some tips and tricks from you, um, you had to. over, over time. And maybe we can get going on that. I think you have a ton of value to provide. Like, like I was telling you before is 
I think everybody has a unique experience in life and like a unique take on things. And I think anybody can create content. Anybody can do it. It's just like a matter of putting your story out there, sharing your journey with people and, uh, and letting people, you know, take value out of that. Cause again, everybody has value to provide. It's just, um, being willing to put, being willing to put yourself out there and, and be vulnerable, I think. And some, a lot of the content that I see for myself that gets the most engagement is when I'm just sharing my story of like, here, here's how I ran my first marathon. And then I progressed to 244. Like people love that stuff because mm-hmm. it's, it's like relatable and, you know, I don't, neither one of us are like elite athletes, at least not right now. Um, and I think, you know, for lack of a better term, we're just like average Joes. Like, you know, we work jobs. We like, um, you know, we're not like Kelvin Kiptums basically. And so we're more relatable to the average person, which is cool. And I think leaning into that and taking advantage of that yeah. is a, uh, is a really good way to go about it. And dude, you're the, you're the perfect example of what you just said. I mean, from where you've gone, you know, in the last, what is it, year, two years and, and just putting stuff out there, being vulnerable. Yeah. Um, and, and people have found that value in the videos that you bring. And I think that's the first thing that I saw whenever I first reached out to you was these strength training videos are so easy to follow. They're so efficient. Yeah. And, and if you do them, I mean, you're going to see results, uh, cause people can just follow what you do. So I yeah. think, uh, kudos to you and, uh, on the stuff that you've put out and, uh, man, I just keep you. Keep, I hope you keep doing it, dude. I hope you start doing it. <laughs> Come on, let's let's try it. I'm I'm putting the uh, the onus on you now. You, you gotta. <laughs> we need to see more Corey Instagram reels. Come on. <laughs> um, okay, and again, best place to connect with you is uh, your Instagram, which is the best is yet to run. Um, dude, thanks again for coming on. This is a blast, bro. I appreciate it so much. Heck yeah! All right, we'll see you later. Thank you so much for tuning into the show. If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to subscribe to the channel, leave a review, and share it with a friend. We'll see you in the next one.